This is the Supernatural Book, Episode 3, The Fall of Man. So we saw how God made Adam and Eve. They're innocent in the garden that the Lord placed them in. Just imagine the best temperature, perfect weather, no pollution, the best scenery ever. Adam's work is good, no bills, no sickness, no corrupt government, no mask mandates, no men going on mandates, just women dates, uh, no corona, the virus or the drink, and things are going pretty good. However, there is an evil creature that's been watching and lurking in the shadows. Lucifer, now the devil who is the serpent, is about to show up to mess up as much of this new world as he can. He is jealous of Adam's dominion, his crown, and probably most of all, his soul. Now begins the battle that we are presently fighting with the devil and his minions. It is a battle for the souls of men. And Genesis 3.1 describes the serpent as more subtle than any beast of the field. 2 Corinthians 11.3 says the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. Don't get confused about who the serpent is. Revelation 20 and verse 2 makes it clear that the dragon, the devil, and Satan and the serpent are one and the same. So how is Lucifer a dragon but can come to Eve as a serpent? That is, that's easy. He's a shapeshifter, a transformer. For example, he isn't an angel, he was a cherub, and now he can transform into an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11.14 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. It's a supernatural book. you got things going on that have nothing to do with your normal life and things that you see in the regular day. You get so caught up in your 40-hour work week and fried chicken and apple pie for dessert and the kids' basketball practice and a cute Sunday morning devotion that you forgot about the spirit world and you forgot about the supernatural book. You think everything is like what you see every day, but it's not. And there is more going on than what you can see with your fleshly eyes. But you see, Adam and Eve are down there in the garden in perfect peace, perfect harmony, perfect safety, running around naked and not even getting arrested for streaking. I mean, really, they... They were naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed, Genesis 2.25 says. I mean, they were letting it all hang out. Adam and Eve never fought over closet space before the fall because all they owned was a birthday suit. Adam didn't have to worry about Eve nagging over his socks in the floor because he walked around barefoot. They didn't fight over the bathroom because they didn't have to use it. If they did, it probably smelled like roses. To be honest, there was no fighting, and every day was like the ending of a Full House episode without the drama it took to get to the end of the episode. Uh, things were going pretty good, but lurking up there in the second heaven, perched on top of his own mountain, self-loathing was the most evil creature in God's creation. Up there, rubbing that ugly long chin, he pulled one of those sons of God over and said, I'm going to mess this thing up. I'm going to mess this thing up if it's the last thing that I do. And that rebellious, betraying, backstabbing son of God said, well, What are you going to do, boss? Maybe you should get Adam to commit adultery. And the devil looks at him strangely and says, Commit adultery? You moron, there is only one woman on the planet and it's his wife. The fallen angel replied back and said, Oh, right, right, I, I forgot. Well, maybe you could just... Send Lilith down there. Lilith? She's just a myth. What have you been reading? Oh, well, maybe you could get him to covet something. And Lucifer looked at him strangely and replied, How can I do that, stupid? Everything on the planet is his. He's got dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and God let him name the things. I should have been able to name them. I mean, he called that thing a duckbill platypus. A duckbill platypus? That's just ridiculous. He says, I know what I'm going to do. You see that tree down there, the tree of knowledge of good and evil? I'm going to get that woman to eat off of that tree. The evil angel looked down and said, brilliant. And he fell down and worshipped him. The devil likes that kind of thing. He said, you know what, you moron? You are a moron, but I appreciate the worship. I think I'm going to call you Moroni. And one of these days, I'm going to let you talk to a guy named Joseph Smith, and you're going to mess up millions of people with this false gospel that I'm cooking up. 
So in Genesis 3, the old serpent approaches the woman when her husband isn't at home. And remember that tree we talked about last time? It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord planted that tree for a reason. You see, the Lord wanted fellowship with creatures that would choose him of their own free will. So he left Lucifer alive, kept him out of everlasting fire, and made a tree that man wasn't supposed to eat off of. And God knows the devil is going to approach Eve and entice her to eat off the tree. The Lord simply uses the devil as a puppet. The devil himself is a weapon of the Lord. Imagine if you were so powerful that the devil was your rod, one of your battle axes. You had the devil in your arsenal and could use him as a weapon on anybody if you wanted to. I mean, if the Lord popped the trunk, you wouldn't see just every everyday ordinary weapons. You would see the burning sun, the devil, and all kinds of other powerful, explosive, deadly things. The thing is, the Lord doesn't even need a weapon to do anything. Having them is just awesome. So the devil is left free to roam. He still has the devil on a leash, but a very, very long leash so that he can go to and fro on the earth, as Job 1-7 talks about. So this is so Adam and Eve would have a choice to choose God or choose the devil. This is so all man can have a choice to choose God or choose the devil. The devil knows all about the tree. He knows all about the agreement between Adam and God. The agreement is, don't eat off the wrong tree and you'll live forever. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. But in walks that old serpent. Eve turns around and there stands an angel of light. And through good words and fair speeches, he was about to deceive the heart of the simple. A lot of the old guys say he appeared as a 33-year-old male, tall, dark, handsome. Maybe he did. I don't know. Maybe he had on sunglasses, a nice suit with his hair slicked back. Whatever he transformed himself into that day, we know that he was a serpent. He was after his first soul. And that old serpent comes out of the shadow of those trees and says, Hey there, Eve. And she says, uh, hello, who are you? Well, he says, well, my name is Lucifer. I was just admiring one of your trees, this one to be specific. And Eve explains to the serpent that she isn't supposed to eat off of that tree or she'll die. But notice how the devil quickly corrects what God told her. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. You see, this was a supernatural tree. Just by eating from the tree, it put a knowledge in Adam and Eve that they didn't have before. Notice the serpent tells her, you shall be as gods. He's telling her that she is going to be better and more knowledgeable than she currently is. Wasn't that Lucifer's temptation himself? He wanted to be greater than God had already made him. He wanted to be like the Most High. So he's tempting Eve with the same thing, trying to get her to want to be greater than God had already made her. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. About that time, sin started pumping through her veins. She had blood pumping through her that was spotted with iniquity. And the devil thought he had his first soul as good as in hell. And he says, now, Eve, get Adam to eat it. Now, you don't want to leave him behind. He needs his deeper knowledge, too. He needs this wisdom from a higher power. So here comes Adam walking through the garden, looking for his bride. And the serpent says, hello, king. And Adam says, king, who, who you calling king? Well, you were crowned with glory and honor, and the Lord gave you dominion, didn't he? Wouldn't it make sense that you would take off the tree and get this deeper knowledge that Eve just got? Don't you want to go to the next level of evolution? If you don't eat, it, eat from the tree, you're going to hold up progress. You're going to hold the human race back. You see, Adam knew it was wrong. He knew what the Lord said. The Lord had given him his word on the tree. 
Adam had the sword in, on his side. All he would have had to do was quote it and say, Thus saith the Lord, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. That was the sword that Adam had on his side. Adam had the weapon on him to defeat the devil in battle. The Word of God. He had the Word of God. Not like me and you have it, but he had a little bit of it. Just a small little bit of the Word of God he had. But he kept it by his side. And there was something in him that loved Eve more than God. And he didn't want her to face death alone. I'm sure Adam said, you disobeyed the Word of the Lord, Eve. And you're going to die. And the serpent, being more subtle than any beast of the field, probably said, You gonna let her die alone, Adam? Don't you love her enough to die for her? And she gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the scriptures say, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Just like that, the devil could probably hear the sin curse flow through the veins of that human king. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And for this reason the wicked are estranged from the womb, they go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. A crown had fallen in the garden. Adam had shed the image of God. They didn't die physically, that day, but the devil had a hand in leading them to their spiritual death and their soon-to-be physical death. And at that moment, they both began to die physically. They would live another 900 years, but that's nothing in light of eternity. But along the way, they would face pain. They would face agony and sorrow. And Adam and Eve made a decision about receiving something into them that hangs on a tree. They chose to take in the supernatural fruit that hung from this forbidden tree, and it put a knowledge in them that wasn't there before. They pretty much signed to deal with the devil. They get deeper knowledge in exchange for their eternal life. And as the scriptures say, he was a murderer from the beginning. The devil had made his first deal with a human. If he, he believed he had his first soul in the bag. The thing was, God told them not to do that. The devil knew he told them not to do that. So the devil was up there in the second heaven, and his plan was simple. He was going to make them rebel just like he rebelled. Today it is the opposite for me and you. Now God wants you to receive what hung on the tree. You see, he didn't want them to, res to take off of that tree back there. But now God wants you to receive what hung on a tree. And the devil wants you to stay away from the tree and never partake of what hangs on this tree. You see, today for me and you, we have to make a decision about receiving not something, but someone that hung on a tree. In 1 Peter 2.24, it says, Who his own self by our sins and his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. You see, we look back, we saw Jesus Christ shedding his blood, and we saw him die on the cross, the tree. Then he was buried and resurrected, and we received that as our payment for our sins. When Adam and Eve partook of the fruit of the tree, they received their knowledge of good and evil. When we receive the one who hung on the tree, we come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2.4 But as punishment to Eve for eating from the tree, she has to have painful childbirth. Adam now has to do hard labor for his food. And the earth changes greatly after this rebellion. God curses the ground. It says in Genesis 3.17, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. The Lord says to Adam, Son, you traded in that crown of glory for a crown of thorns. It may have seemed like harsh punishment from a wrathful God, but Adam had no idea of the love God had toward him and Eve. All the time, Adam had no idea 
that one day the Lord was going to personally come down and put that crown of thorns on himself and take care of all this mess. That sin brought a mess into this world. And it says in Romans 8.22, For we know that the whole cre creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. One day, 6,000 years ago, two people ate off of a tree, and now you have to pay bills, work hard, get sick, and die. The animals change as a result of sin coming in. Animals that Adam could at once lie down with will now become deadly to him. Adam and Eve didn't die physically that day, but they died spiritually and will have to face a physical death later because of what happened. Adam and Eve are out there in the garden and they are at a loss of what to do. You see, they knew that death awaited them just like any human. Their first instinct is to find a cure. Because it said Genesis 3, 7, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. In an attempt to fix things, they sewed fig leaves together and made aprons to cover up their shame. Perhaps the serpent himself told them this would be a good idea. Maybe they did it because man's first idea is to try to fix himself. The fig leaves pictures our own good works that we try and use to cover up our shame of sin. But all of a sudden, a breeze comes through. They get silent, and they hear something that sounds like many waters. They got so scared, their knees smote one against another. Their hair stood on end. Their bones trembled within themselves. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And here comes the Lord, acting as if he doesn't know where Adam and Eve are hiding. It says in Job 34, 22, There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. You see, it's just like when you play hide-and-seek with your kids. You pretend you don't see their foot sticking out from under the couch, and you say, Ready or not, here I come. Where are you hiding? You already know where they're hiding. You're just pretending like you don't. The serpent was probably standing next to the tree that Adam was hiding behind and saying, Over here, Lord, over here. You see, you know he was loving every second of this. You know he's the accuser of the brethren. He's saying, yeah, these guys are over here, Lord, the ones that ate the fruit. They're right here. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? You see, the Lord seen the whole thing in 4K, in HD. Surround sound. He, he saw it more clear than anything we ever seen. He, he knows what happened, but the Lord wants a confession. Sure, the Lord knew about that sin you committed last night, but he wants a confession. They begin to blame each other. They blame the serpent. Adam eventually blames God without blaming God, and the serpent believes in his heart he has damned the first two humans to hell and has his first two souls in the bag. But it's not over. If anyone has a remedy for sin, the Lord knows the remedy. You see, God introduced them to something that would temporarily appease his wrath and give them temporarily forgiveness of sin. Genesis 3.21 And Adam also and his wife did, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. God had to shed the blood of an innocent animal, most likely a lamb. At the time, they had no idea that this was a picture of what God would become for us. He would become one day the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. The devil watched as the Lord performed this sacrifice, and he desired to look into it. He saw as the Lord pulled the souls of Adam and Eve right back out of his of the devil's briefcase. He, the, he, he thought he had their souls in the briefcase. The Lord pulled them right back out. And Adam and Eve would have then, would have then seen that shedding of blood was a requirement of, to get their sins covered. Eve might have said blood. What's blood? But Adam, as the head of the house, would explain, it's what we need to temporarily get forgiveness of our sins. And the devil sees this going on, and you know what he's eventually going to do? Entice people to sacrifice their own children to him. Now he wants a bloody sacrifice. And the devil knows that there's power in the blood. Hebrews 9.22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. And I'm sure Satan has a photographic-like memory. But if the devil recorded things in a journal, the devil probably took out his journal 
and wrote down some things, he probably would have wrote, Entry number one, man has a soul, so hunt it. Entry number two, man has dominion and a crown, so take it. Entry number three, man needs innocent blood to get forgiveness of sin, so direct him to something else. And here's a quick flashback. Notice the Lord says something very significant to the serpent. Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So the seed of the woman is going to bruise the serpent's head. And when the devil hears this, it adds more fuel to his fire. Now he's going to aim his crosshairs on the seed. You will see him attack the seed all through the scriptures. The seed is Jesus Christ, and you can trace his line all the way back to Adam. You see the devil's hand in trying to destroy this seed all the way through the entire supernatural book. And Satan's entry number four could have been kill the seed. Adam and Eve partook of the wrong tree. They chose the one that brought death. But don't forget about the tree of life. It says in Genesis 3.22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. You see, God didn't want man to live forever in his sinful state. The blood of an animal only gave them temporary forgiveness. He didn't want to make them born again. It didn't give them eternal life. This wouldn't be an option until the Lord Jesus Christ showed up. Adam and Eve may have their sins temporarily covered, but death still has victory over them. God already has a plan, though, and it no longer involves Adam and Eve getting eternal life from the tree of life. Genesis 3, 23 and 24 says, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. To keep everyone out of the garden, the Lord placed cherubims and a flaming sword to guard the entrance. And that's what we'll get into in the next episode of the Supernatural Book.